I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine channel. Today we continue with the Psychic Bible, the apocryphal scriptures of Genesis Briar Peorage, and the Third Mind of the Temple of Psychic Youth. Section 122. Uh, part C of Part 13. The Process is the Product. Changed Priorities Ahead. By 1991, what had become a dedicated inner circle drawn from the Brighton T.O.P.Y. contingent who were called Ratio 5, the closest T.O.P.Y. had to a quote-unquote Omega, had been traveling around the north of England looking at various properties for sale. As weekly routines and rituals had developed in Brighton amongst the five houses, a group feeling had grown directing us to want to make a next step in communal living. Our sense of deeply bonding through our life story exercises, telepathy circles, and some gestalt routines I had gradually introduced were profoundly stripping away so many complexes and neuroses in what we all believed were effective healing ways. And a real craving to go deeper, push ourselves harder to expose and shed all previous identities and personalities began to obsess us. Clearly, those individuals prepared to seek revelation no matter how much psychological or emotional pain might be ahead proposed that it was time to find a big house somewhere rural and remote enough for us to be undisturbed, peaceful, self-sufficient to some degree, and able to have the option of naked outdoor ceremonies and rituals without provoking neighbors or the media. This is when the Ratio 5 found themselves sensing an oncoming rift within T.O.P.Y. By this time, I was regularly consulting my process archives and commentaries for solutions to organizational problems and new psychological games to maintain the intellectual forward motion of T.O.P.Y. At what turned out to be the last formal T.O.P.Y. Global Assembly in Brighton, we chose to reveal various problems that had arisen. Unlike the process, which insisted on the surrender of all assets upon joining, T.O.P.Y. was funded primarily by Temple Records and Temple Press, and to a far lesser degree, the various market stalls. As the network grew, so did the drain on our personal incomes. The Ratio 5 were subsidizing T.O.P.Y., and it was beginning to feel like we were working longer and longer hours to keep publications and events flowing, whilst the vast majority of individuals had become consumers who only turned up for the fun, but were glaringly absent when hard work was needed. The Ratio 5 put this iniquity up for discussion and were shocked at the bitter response they received. We had suggested that upon acquisition of a big house, any TPY individuals applying to live there full-time would have to donate a to-be-decided minimum proportion of their assets. We felt that if we were selling our homes in order to purchase a building large enough to be a robust, robust and workable community, it was only fair that others benefiting from our faith in TOPY should also give at least enough to prove their sincere commitment to making a living example of our idealistic concept for a radical contemporary evolutionary lifestyle. In our evolutionary fervor, we were shocked at the resentment and financial constipation we faced. It seemed that anything we supplied that was attractive, stimulating, exciting, fun, and free was great and consumed happily with gusto, but requests even a paltry donation to make it happen and you were just another greedy cult trying to rip us off and similar deflections from the truth as we saw it. This was a depressing day. Suddenly the process and Zygdendik and others' approach was illuminated and illuminating. Our altruism had set up an illusory image and expectation. We had imagined that everyone was as totally committed as we were, because they said they were, and we believed them. The schism that had ruined the momentum of the process was, we had felt, about the distribution of power amongst the Omega, and to a slightly lesser extent, how those alliances within the inner circles and also the depth and distribution of loyalty amongst the members got played out. I had hoped to remember the past and try not to be condemned to repeat it, but we had hit a serious intransigent in suburban block in block with a C. With hindsight, I can see the rebel faction were jealous of the charisma and respect that tended to be associated with myself and also the Ratio 5 inner circle in Brighton. We seemed to have the more glamorous role, media visibility, mainly vicious and negative, but notoriety appeals to the young, and I had a nice house and car. None of this was paid for by T.O.P.Y., in fact, the reverse. The reality was that all my decades of hard work making art and music seemed impossible for them to grasp. By the end of T.O.P.Y.'s 
public existence, ratio, ratio to individuals who are living rent and utility bill free in the Georgian TOP White House I'd purchased, emptied bank balances, maximized debts on printing and other accounts, vandalized the nursery as well as the kitchens, bathrooms, and many walls while Psychic TV were away on tour in the USA to replenish the very funds they were being trusted with access to. Access points indeed. Analysis of my oracular template, the process, did not bode well for our future. At the same time that the money schism was rupturing 10 years' dedication, we also felt obliged to bring up the ongoing but more threatening matter of a yellow mafia media witch hunt. I was starting to question the wisdom of referencing the process as our tactical mirror, and things were getting spooky in all the wrong ways. Just before I had taken my family away from East London to Brighton in 1988, we were thrust into the public eye at a national level when the People newspaper ran a bogus, vicious, vicarious, and sensational full-page article with the headline, This Vile Man Corrupts Kids, Demigod Feeds Pop Fans on Sex, Sadism, and Devil Rights. We discovered we'd been under surveillance. Casual and close friends and neighbors alike had been interrogated and bullied. Shades of the Mindbenders of Mayfair set off warning bells in my head. I had been officially declared, again, an enemy of society, a wrecker of morals, as well as civilization, and a target for any unscrupulous journalist and nutcase on the street using outrage as an excuse for intolerance. During the time leading up to my speech to TOPY Global, my family and I had be be begun being subject to a growing campaign of harassment and disinformation again. A TOPY individual working in the local post sorting office Warn me our mail was being opened and copied by the authorities and to be careful. Not long before this warning, Scotland Yard had raided Mr. Sebastian's tattoo and piercing studio, later charging him and several other men, none of whom ever knew each other, with the being a gay S&M porn ring. They were tried in the Old Bailey, usually reserved to try serial killers, spies, and the worst of the worst criminals. This case became notorious as the Spanner case. I was originally on the list of people to try, and then my name dropped off. The case was tried by one judge who eventually ruled piercing and tattooing a criminal act of grievous bodily harm. A charge immediately below manslaughter with a sentence up to seven years. One poor man received three years in prison for piercing his own foreskin. Souvenir photos he got developed for himself alone were the damning evidence. Mr. Seb got a maximum fine and initially a seven-year prison sentence, eventually reduced to suspended when the court discovered he was dying of cancer. All were found guilty, thus setting a legal precedent in Britain to prosecute anybody with a piercing or tattoo or who created one. Suddenly, in 1991, my body and many of those in T.O.P.Y. was illegal. It seems impossible now, just 15 or so years later, to believe this was true. Copies of Modern Primitives, the classic R research book we'd helped put together and were featured in, were seized at customs. Clearly a right-wing faction of the Tory government in collusion with powerful figures at Scotland Yard were on a mission to marginalize, penalize, and viciously shatter the lives of a blood gay scene and saw they saw as corrupting and intolerable and anyone else who they saw as proselytizing, piercing and tattooing was obviously conspiring to undermine decent family values which meant T.O.P.Y. in general and myself in particular we knew my name had been removed at the last minute from the list of those charged but why my deduction I had become aware that we were still being watched and investigated and wondered if that meant that they were planning to do something nasty to us separately They'd use the only thing the Spanner case men had in common, the fact that they were gay, to link them, pretend they were in a circle, and therefore a conspiracy. I didn't fit into the, that stereotyping, so I was being saved up to be pilloried and stopped in my decadent tracks. One of the side effects of regular sigilizing and telepathy and similar practices is an increased sensitivity to intuiting the ebbs and flows of events and future options for actions. I was convinced we were heading towards a nasty collision with the establishment once more. So at TYPY Global, I raised this issue. I proposed increased vigilance and security at meetings. No strangers to have access to filing cabinets, rituals, ratio 3, or above meetings or publications. To my dismay, I was immediately attacked as being e egocentric and totalitarian for seeing myself as a target rather than everyone or nobody. The Ratio 5 individuals tried to point out that it was simply a fact of life that, fair or not, the lead singer of a band tends to be the public's focus, and also being the key founder of T.O.P.Y. and a national media presence already, and therefore, inevitably, I was going to be interpreted and assumed to be the leader of T.O.P.Y., like it or not, fair or not. The process tried having a clear autocratic leadership in the Omega that was then wrapped in impenetrable secrecy, contrary to T.O.P.Y.'s transparency and democracy. Both strategies failed when it came to confrontation with the absolute morality 
amorality and scurrilousness of the British yellow press. Just look at Alistair Crowley, Oscar Wilde, and Quentin Crisp's experience before ours. Frontal assault on these journalists is doomed by iniquity. TOPY Global got very combative and emotional, and it became clear that resentment of anybody who found themselves in the limelight for any reason was irrationally high. The individuals who worked day in and day out for TOPY felt they had remained anonymous and invisible whilst their hard work consolidated and expanded the appearance of myself as titular leader of TOPY. I could tour the world with Psychic TV with an ever-increasing fan base through their endless labors. Of course, there was enough truth in that equation to feed their rage and burgeoning intolerance of the inner circle, ratio 5. The only form of denial open to me was to state with my intentions were honorable, and, as T.O.P.Y. says, intention is the key. So my purity of motive was, I still believe, a personal disinterest in the ego glory, but acceptance of it as a necessary cultural phenomenon whose upside was that it allowed T.O.P.Y. to exist throughout its byproduct of income. I was more or less held down by a wolf pack who, it became clear, were organizing a coup of some kind. One of our recent changes of policy, partly in response to the negative media campaign in Britain, was very similar to the process, involved TOPY more directly in local community affairs. Perhaps we could diffuse the prejudice and intimidation by doing good works that would familiarize us bit by bit for a public otherwise only fed horror stories. Apart from our digger influence free goods actions, over the course of several TOPY station meetings, we finally linked up directly with my secret but integral map for cult and anti-cult navigation of an antagonistic popular culture, The Process. Through a mutual friend, Eve, I was introduced to Timothy Wiley. Eve knew of my fascination with The Process and my search for the realities behind it, rather than to accept the tiny vague amount of gratuitous misinformation available when she introduced us. Timothy was everything I had hoped he might be and more, and his sharp, dry intelligence and wit, combined with his encyclopedia's psychedelic knowledge and application of spiritual matters, blew me away in the same inspirational cosmosis of energy that Brian Jason and William S. Burroughs had. When I met Timothy, I recall telling him that I had been stalking him in the process since the 60s. It was meant humorously, but was also true in essence. Seeing the integrated clarity of his ways of being confirmed for me in the residual constructive impact of the process, methodology, and dedication, despite the negative and traumatic memories that went with it. At first, Timothy was somewhat reluctant to discuss the process. I understood why I was, and really still am, reluctant to discuss T.O.P.Y. with casual acquaintances. There is pain and disappointment there. It is hard for anyone to imagine what it feels like to be attacked over and over again, not just by the yellow media, but by the government, harassed by the police, and then alienated from friends and foes by the taint of lies and innuendos of vile secret behaviors and associations. Associations. Timothy was living in New York at that time and was directing his beneficent resources towards dolphin sentience, extraterrestrials, and angels. Brighton had a dolphinarium where two dolphins suffered terribly, both psychologically and physically, from cruel conditions. TOPY station decided to try and close the dolphinarium by picketing the entrance every single wait weekend and peacefully asking people not to go inside and thus financially collude in the ongoing torture of these super-intelligent beings. Over a year and a bit, TOPY picketed the dolphinarium rain and shine, never missing a weekend thanks to TOPY individuals traveling from all over Britain and Europe to maintain our presence, eventually enlisting the support of animal rights groups. Psychic TV, Julian Cope, Captain Sensible of the Damned, and other caring friends participating in benefits. We released a CD called Condole, the aboriginal name for a whale spirit, to finance the campaign. We received a secret message from sympathetic workers inside the Dolphinarium who'd risked their jobs and would now lose them by giving us information on the health of the dolphins to say that business was closing down for good. Magic and theory and practice indeed. Through the charity of the Aga Khan, our two dolphins were flown to the Turks and Caicos Islands for rehabilitation. Timothy Wiley had inspired us, and as a marvelous side effect, he has become a lifelong friend and mentor. Timothy became my oracular fallback position. He had already been through all this and more, so in times of isolation, desolation, and doubt, I would call him for advice. We could both see a pattern that intimated trouble ahead in my public and private life. Lama Yeshi, the recent ma retreat master at Sam Ye Ling in Scotland, had suggested forcefully that I go to Nepal. So I called upon the TOPY network to donate good quality new warm children and baby clothes, packed them up in large numbers, and flew my family to Kathmandu. 
He gave us the contact information for their monastery there. We had a children's clothes drives with NTOPY and Psychic TV fans, and off we went. We linked up with Samye Ling's monastery there and financed out of my savings a twice-daily clean water and meal kitchen at Budanoth Stupa in Kathmandu. Some days we fed 300 to 400 Tibetan refugees, lepers, and beggars. In between, we took teachings and meditated. After a few days, one of the monks asked me to become the mentor of Shogyong Chungpa Rinpoche's son. For the next months, I would almost daily visit the monastery and take Shogyong's son on field trips to Shiva temples and other comparative religious sites. We made quite a sight, me in all black leather and him in his orange and saffron robes. Suddenly, a fax arrived. Serious trouble. Call home immediately. The witch-hunting media bomb had exploded. On Saturday, February 15, 1992, 23 Scotland Yard detectives from the Obscene Publication Squad, armed with a search warrant and video camera, raided my Brighton home. They seized two tons of photographic video and other material, African drums, ethnic art, sex toys. On Sunday, February 16, 1992, the Observer ran a story entitled, Video Offers First Evidence of Ritual Abuse. It reported that they had a film of bloody satanic ritual which they'd passed on to the police. Small fragments of this video were included in a one-hour TV documentary series, Dispatches, on Channel 4, in which the journalist Andrew Boyd claimed it shows abuse of young adults in what is clearly a ritual context. Sex and blood rituals are taking place beneath a picture of Aleister Crowley. The trappings of black magic are obvious, they claimed, as hazy, blurred, and distorted images were televised. These claims were backed by the so-called testimony of a cult survivor, herself calling herself Jennifer, who told in sick and graphic detail that this was her having a forced abortion to be used in sacrificial rituals and by statements from the police and medical experts. By Sunday, February 23rd, the Independent on Sunday was able to report, truthfully at last, that these videos that were being used to claim to be the first hard evidence of a satanic child abuse were actually made nine years earlier. One video was created for Spanish national television's La Da De Oro program on Psychic TV, and the other as performance art commissioned by the same Channel 4, in that they featured film director Derek Jarman as a visual presenter of a fictional cult and an exercise of how media can manipulate perceptions and control responses. Derek was quoted saying, At first I was horrified and then very, very angry that they so misrepresented scenes in the video. It was not even about child abuse or murder. It seemed too much when you had a lady on the telly blacked out saying that she had killed her child. I mean, doesn't anyone smell a rat? By Sunday, March 1st, 1992, the Mail on Sunday newspaper had traced the elusive Jennifer. She was named as Louisa Arrington, mother of two healthy children and one time born-again Christian, who had never had any contact, not even by mail, with anyone connected to T.O.P.Y. In 1990, Louise had stayed at L.L. Grange, a quote-unquote Christian healing center in Lancaster, England. She was now quoted as saying, There, the charismatics had an overpowering effect on me. In many ways, that was the worst three months of my life. They told me I was possessed by demons because of the sins of my mother and father. They prayed over me in tongues and taught me to face my own guilt. One day she met the Christian cult spiritual leader, Peter Horobin. He told her one of his prayers teams had a vision. He had seen a mind picture of me standing over a tiny baby, helping a devil priest cut into the baby's chest. The blood was collected and we drank it. The baby's body was a sacrifice to Satan. Louise had never had this baby, of course. She continued, I screamed and pleaded with them to stop it. Then I had a kind of fit and had to be held down by these Christians. I fought people off physically. Finally, I broke down and confessed it was true. I said, yes, I did it. I killed my own little daughter and helped others to kill their babies. The confession of this key witness in the dispatches program, and the others in the same way, was brought about by the horrific vision of paranoid, malicious, born-again Christians. None of the three witnesses had ever heard of T.O.P.Y. when asked. On March the 22nd, the author, researcher, and presenter admitted to inconclusive research, misleading identification, and entirely fabricated testimonies. But the damage was done. Always in the shadow of the Spanner case in which T.O.P.Y. had openly supported and provided funds, safe haven, and security for Mr. Sebastian, it became apparent that I had been singled out as a scapegoat for everything in British culture that disturbed the status quo and the conservative government's witch-hunt-style paranoia. I was advised that if we returned from Nepal, Scotland Yard would arrest me and hold me for questioning indefinitely and take my two daughters into custody who would then likely be interrogated for evidence of child abuse. A completely false accusation of abuse usually led the children being in the state's care for two or more years, regardless of truth. We have never to this day been charged with anything, nor has my archive and property been returned. In fact, Scotland Yard have implied it was all destroyed for no legal reason. 
Our attorney told us in a frank phone call that our best course of action to protect our children and ourselves was to go into exile, as off the record someone at Scotland Yard had said they could not guarantee my physical safety if I returned. Which he said he interpreted as a serious and real threat from unknown but officially sanctioned persons. He felt that we were being told to stay away or expect extreme prejudice. To this day, the idea of being obliquely threatened with, gosh, it seems so weird even now to type this, but it is what was discussed, assassination by accident, vanishing random murder or suicide. The options are endless for any cabal with protected and politically limitless power, and it feels very surreal, still scary, and also a ludicrous overreaction, no matter how insincere or casual the intimidation. And as people who have pointed out since, it was a great compliment to TOPY that we were seen as subversive and well-organized enough to merit such a special attention. Needless to say, with two wonderful children to protect, it was a no-brainer and we agreed to not go back to Britain to fight the smear campaign in the media, and if if necessary, the courts. This decision was reinforced by the knowledge that such notables as Crowley, Crisp, and Wilde had tried that tactic and failed. So we needed to conceive of a different strategy to take our time and consider other options. I went to seek advice from Zongar, Kietzi, Rinpoche, and the Tibetan monks we worked with at the soup kitchen we had financed. He said, go to America. A Hindu Agori Baba said the same thing. In my confusion at the turn of events, despite knowing Zongar would be correct in his advice, my natural need for affirmation took me back to Paglanda Nagori Baba, who had given me insight into their path of no distinction. See the Gnosis interview elsewhere. And I asked him the same question. I am an exile now, a refugee. Where do I go next? America, he said. Laughing so heartily, the 24-karat gold psychic cross I'd given him bounced on his ash-smeared chest. There are times when the options are simple, no matter how much we hope for a more fuzzy escape from our destiny. In one of these classic magical moments that seemed to befriend one through repeated ritual and focus, as I sat in the hotel room in Kathmandu wondering where to go, I messed idly about with some unopened post I had thrown in my bag as we left England. It was from Michael Horowitz, archivist for Dr. Timothy Leary, and in it he had written, If you ever need a refuge, call me at this number. I did, and he immediately offered myself and my family sanctuary at his home in Petaluma. I returned to the Tibetan Rinpoche, and after joking that we were all refugees now, I gave him my remaining $5,000 to cover the cost of a small water-powered electricity generator for his monastery so they could avoid ecological disaster burning all the surrounding trees. It was an act of faith in magic and truth. I kept just enough to get to California. I had maxed out the cash I could get with my credit cards and knew there was no more in England even if I could access it, which was in doubt at this point. After giving the Tibetans the $5,000 in my stash to build their generator, I was essentially close to penniless. The Tibetans who ran the Varaj Hotel offered us indefinite free accommodation in return for our months of good works, and in the end, Wax Chacks Records paid for our tickets one way to America. At home, the TOPY network that I had forewarned of this kind of action disintegrated. Only the individuals Ratio 5 lifted a finger to help or support or publicly speak up in my defense. The rest hid or even gloated, unaware of any irony. And suddenly, there I was, exiled in America, just like the process and for much the same reason, the small-minded and bigoted parochialism of the gray minions of inherited wealth and power. I could see how the process experienced an equally irrational campaign to destroy cripple financially and break the will of their members for having the audacity to build a set of logics that included the names of Jehovah, Satan, Lucifer, and later Christ. Hindsight tells me that just as T.O.P.Y. underestimated the outrage that inclusion of sexuality and its mission would cause to its folly, so the process misjudged the ongoing bigotry and hypocrisy of the establishment when they included Satan and Lucifer in their panoply of gods. Who could have guessed, though, that in the swinging 60s liberation from inhibition and oppression, there would still be such a furor over these antiquated notions? I often speculate what might have transpired if those red rags to John Bull had not been used as symbols of the personality type ratios. Would the gutter press have left the process alone? Would its evolution have continued inexorably until it was as established as other cults like the Moonies, Scientology, etc.? Certainly the use of Satan in particular seems to have been a strategic problem as things turned out. But we have to ask ourselves why. Why do certain concepts like Satan or the open inclusion of orgasm and sexuality in an experimental search for a more integrated integrity-based way of life cause politicians, clergy, and journalists to dub me, for example, a wrecker of civilization? Or a national newspaper to trumpet that I should be bound in chains, locked in a cage, and key thrown away? This book may not answer that question directly. But keep in mind the fear of the unknown coupled with corruption in places of power and a dreary but paranoid policy of maintaining the power of vested interests long after they are redundant at all costs, 
underlies the facade of our mundane daily culture. Freedom of thought, self-designed ethics, and a questioning mind with an altruistic belief in the potential for positive evolution in our human species can expose to the light the impoverished decay of society. The process was ostracized and forced into exile in the United States, and then myself and my family were forced into exile in 1991 for our, our essential involvement and faith in T.O.P.Y. Genesis Briar Peorage, NYC, 2008. Beneath it is the Temple of Psychic Youth and the Temple, the, excuse me, the Psychic Cross. And there's a section break. The tree of self-knowledge. What we have here is a diagram, which would roughly line up with the Sephiro. On the leftmost side, from the top to bottom, is reconciliation with morality, wisdom, and awareness. On the right side, from top to bottom, is guiltlessness, true will, and willpower. And on the center, from top to bottom, is self-knowledge, integration of self, inner freedom, discipline, control of robot, and action. You ought to learn more about yourself. Think more than just I, I, I. What appears to be an infatuation with the self is in fact not selfish at all, as the individual is, through self-knowledge, aware and in control of the ego. In modern times, there is no lack of understanding of the fact that man is a social being and no man is an island entire of itself. Hence, there is no lack of extortion that he should love his neighbor, or at least not be nasty to him, and should practice tolerance, compassion, and understanding. At the same time, however, the culture of self-knowledge has fallen into virtually total neglect, unless that is to say it is the object of active suppression. That you cannot love your neighbor unless you love yourself. That you cannot understand your neighbor until you understand yourself. That there can be no knowledge of the invisible person, the intentions behind the actions, who is your neighbor except on the basis of self-knowledge. These fundamental truths are forgotten and even by many of the professionals of the established religions. It is clear that self-knowledge is in fact the benefit of all provided. The necessary discipline is exerted to externalize the internal workings this involves. None of these concepts here outlined in shorthand form are new or evolutionary, revolutionary, nor are they intended to be. They are simply those which Catholic or psychic youth may utilize having appealed to his or her reason. Now it is up to the Catholic or psychic youth, him or her, to find a satisfactory method of training discipline to produce self-control. There are many people in institutions that would insincerely care to lay down this system of training in a dogmatic and authoritarian manner. However, for a real realization and use of these assimilated concepts, the individual must always have to establish discipline by themselves for their self. It would seem that in so doing, it is vital for the individual to take into account the curious and diverse methods rituals worked out and used by others over the centuries. To use an alchemical metaphor, no one should be left unturned in search of the philosopher's stone. The slender knowledge referred to earlier is virtual. All of us have some slender knowledge of being conscious of our own self-consciousness. All of us have some experience of the intangible truth of sensual feeling and the power of intellect. Individuals of the temple combine these three experiences into one in their method rituals as a final stage action in the self-knowledge tree. These are experiences to be wondered at, and as Socrates said, wonder is the feeling of a philosopher and philosophy begins with wonder. No god is a philosopher or seeker after wisdom, for he is no wise already. Neither do the ignorant seek after wisdom, for herein is the evil of ignorance, that he is neither good nor wise, is nevertheless satisfied with himself. We seek after wisdom only to be able to develop a personal philosophy comprehensive enough to embrace the whole of knowledge, a belief in so vast that all the contradictions can easily move around in it. This is indispensable as a place where slender knowledge of these experiences can be shared. This is vital if we are to achieve any of the things we strive for. We can all learn from others' disciplines for taping the second and third levels on the tree of self-knowledge. Others' descriptions and use of these experiences give us all the proof we need. Both Catholic and psychic youth believe that the full potential of man is set by the grace of humanity. We all possess within us, as latent powers, the visionary brilliance of the great poets, artists, and philosophers, which, under active imagination, gives rein to astral projection, psychokinesis, telepathy, precognition, second sight.
The psychic youth, however, believes that it is due to science and religion that these facilities are lacking. The present danger does not lie in the loss of universality on the party of the scientists, but rather in his pretense and claim of totality. What we have to deplore, therefore, is not so much the fact that scientists are specializing, but rather the fact that scientists are generalizing. Western man has fallen into a state of impotence because of his civilization is irrational and superficial, and the Christian church is to some extent to blame for this predicament. Christianity, with its increasingly dogmatic content, has alienated consciousness from its natural roots in the young gods. The type of, temple of psychic youth refutes the methods and rituals of both these bodies as they actively suppress the development, or at least best inertly ignore existence of these facilities. Editor's note, uh, they are getting a bit into opinion here beyond magic, and you should keep that into account and throw away what is not useful to you and keep what is useful. However, there are powerful magical principles that are kind of underlying a lot of this, so do not shy away from trying to understand it, and if you can, assume that there's something in it for you. Moving on. Our science is methods and rituals. Obsessed with backwardness, reiterate the uselessness of all material things in themselves. In our hands, they are useful tools for self-awareness. Outside this, they are nothing. Whether it is a method of destruction, a method of indoctrination, or a method of promoting superficiality, it is entirely meaningless and a complete waste of time and energy. To foister these things are the importance of life as big brother and big business would have us believe is ludicrous. Commentary on the Tree of Self-Knowledge A glance at this tree sees actions as the most important sephiroth being the end result of all other sephiroth. Yet, however important the result is, it is the inner workings that to the individual will be the most virtual, and she, he, will be constantly reevaluating these. The action will either express these workings in material form to oneself and others, or be used to develop these inner workings further, the alchemist's tools. The tree is random like life, a chaos, and so any order one wishes to impose on this randomness is simply to heighten one's understanding of the chaotic systems involved. This order is not philosophy in itself, as some would have us believe. Again, it's a tool to be put into practice by the individual who could and should impose his own order as the author has done. The author's order is a trigger for others. The tree is meaningless until put into practice, as are all theories. The temple of psychic youth is practicing now. All the methods, results, conclusions are available to all involved once the individual is at the stage where comparisons and evaluations of this kind are necessary and useful. If these ideas are confused and misleading now, burn them now. See how many levels they have fallen. Man's intellect, man, animal, plant, mineral. Will your flame be the one to be thrown down to where they can have no effect? Words without provocation are as meaningless as philosophy without application. 1. Deliberate contradiction. 2. Yes, a scientific process. 3. The author here associates pain with implementation. Our religion's methods, rituals of repetitive prayers, voluntary fasting, celibacy... For some individuals may follow the outline of the tree of self-knowledge. However, as the church is an instructive body, the action that comes out of these inner realizations is always set in the emotional moral realm of reference to the instructor. As the instructor is inherently conformist and concerned with the perpetuation of the status quo, the chance of this method provoking an evolutionary breakthrough is remote. The hand of this chance has been forced in history only by those groups or individuals setting off as a tangent to their instructor the degree of which is calculated with care. This can be seen in a century where the so-called enlightened are in fact simply obsessed with bludgeoning all their pseudo-religious moral crusades. So let us herald our very own crusade. We who do not believe awareness can be forced down people's throats. We who desire to share and exchange real knowledge and experience. We who care to educate and be educated, to bring things out of ourselves and others. We who refuse to shroud and mystify our ideas and our ideals with coats of crap. We who have a life a love of life, and individuals so strong as to break our hearts each day and night. We who fight so as not to be trampled underfoot, we call ourselves the Temple of Psychic Youth, we who unite yet stand apart. See Richard Jevons, 23-1-84, which would be the first month, January 23rd, 1984, for Americans out there. The Temple of Psychic Youth can be constant reminder to be referred to and compared against the actions of worth work of the individual. Just as a Catholic would refer to a place of worship where guilt is lodged in the mind of the individual, so a psychic youth should be able to refer back to the place where the freedom of absolute guiltlessness is lodged in the mind. Both Catholic and psychic youth will use these references to gauge the validity of their work. The intention of the Catholic may be to purify the individual through avoidance of sin, but the method 
is uh, so guilt-ridden and fear-provoking that the result is negative positivism. The original positive intention to move forward is negated by the fear and guilt of doing so. Both Catholic and psychic youth refute the maps of real knowledge we are given. We do not believe that only those things that can be proved to exist are of importance. Neither do we believe that those things for which there is no proof of existence are unimportant. The slanderous of knowledge that may be obtained of the highest things is more desirable than the most certain knowledge obtained by lesser things. So-called scientific objectivity proclaims that man is nothing but a complex biochemical mechanism powered by a combustion system which energizes computers with prodigious storage facilities for attaining encoded information, or even worse, a naked ape. We recognize that under scientific methods, rituals, th these observations are correctly made. Therefore, we prefer to use our own methods and rituals, which, unlike the scientific, take into account those followed by virtually all our ancestors until quite a recent generation. Editor's note. I'm going to slow down for a second. And I'm going to repeat one and a half sentences for emphasis. And I quote, We recognize that under scientific methods and rituals, those observations are correctly made. Therefore, we prefer to use our own methods and rituals. And moving on. Behavior baffles me, for I find myself not doing what I really want to do, but doing what I truly loathe. Yet surely if I do the things I really don't want to do, it cannot be said that I am doing, nothing, doing them at all. We cannot only conclude from this that there is not only more than one eye, but also that one seems to be higher than the other as one eye judges the other. St. Paul incidentally concludes that it must be sin that has made his home in my nature. This sephiroth also includes the integration of the subconscious with the conscious. And the chapter ends with notes, which I will read. Zero. All references and quotations express to the author some intangible truth, slender knowledge that he has felt or experienced and sees here put in an understandable and honest manner. They are literary formulations of earlier inner realizations. 1. This place, as well as being imaginary, may well be a remembrance of physical activities or indeed ideally a place where these activities may be realized unrestricted. 2. Work here also means the path of life they are following, not necessarily magical, though. 3. These maps may be seen in any place of education, or anti-education, for rather than bringing out these institutions, put in. 4. St. Thomas Aquinas Summa Theological. 1 I, 5 at I. 5. Victor E. Frankel, Reductionism and Nihilism in A. Kostler and J.R. Simps Beyond Reductionism. 6. The Ultimate Insult to Man's Potential. 7. That it is because if emotions, feelings cannot be measured or calculated, they do not exist. This pragmatic attitude is slowly being taken over by another where these feelings exist, but only if they have practical applications which can be measured. Neither is satisfactory. 8. See commentary on the tree of self-knowledge, having studied this tree. 9. A.K.A. self-awareness of self-consciousness. 10. See Victor Newberg. 11. What Young refers to as an individual, Abraham Maslow calls this self-actualization, Colin Wilson wholeness, as St. Paul observes in a letter to the Romans, my own... Dot, 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 dot. 12. See Mark Allman's guiltless or Alistair Crowley's fear-conquering methods. 13. Recognizing the poverty of philosophical opinions, not adhering to any of them seeking the truth I saw. From Sotenapata 4, Index 3. 14. Stemming from the five Sephiroth surrounding. 15. Both Crowleyan terms. The latter is the amount of power one has to govern one's one surrounding through action as opposed to the surrounding actions governing the action. The former is the director of this action. 16. These two Sephiroth can be loosely tied together. The latter is Colin Wilson's term, see mysteries, what Goonjeef calls non-mechanical consciousness, Ospensky calls overcoming sleep. See Maurice Nichols' psychological commentaries on the teaching of Gurdjieff and Ospensky. 17. Lou Reed, Caroline says. 18. John Donne, Devotion. 17. 19. E.F. Schumacher, A Guide for the Perplexed. 20. See the First Temple Manual. 21. Plato Symposium, translated by Jowett. 22. Remy de Coma. 23. Carl Gustav Jung's Psychology and Alchemy in C. Wilson's Mysteries. Thus concludes section 
122 of the Psychic Bible, Part C of Part 13. The process is the product. Tomorrow we will continue with Section 123, Part 14, Pandrogeny. See you then.